These readings are adapted from a series of notes and articles published immediately after the death of Michael Collins in 1922. The book was entitled The Path to Freedom. The writings have been edited to reflect the path of Michael Collins' own life and testament. After a national struggle sustained through many centuries, we have today in Ireland a native government deriving its authority solely from the Irish people and acknowledged by England and the other nations of the world. Through those centuries, through hopes and through disappointments, the Irish people have struggled to get rid of a foreign power, which was preventing them from exercising their simple right to live and to govern themselves as they pleased, which tried to destroy our nationality, our institutions, which tried to abolish our customs and blot out our civilization. All that made us Irish, all that united us as a nation. But Irish nationality survived. It did not perish when native government was destroyed and a foreign military despotism was set up. And for this reason, that it was not made by the old native government and it could not be destroyed by the foreign usurping government. It was the national spirit which created the old native government and not the native government which created the national spirit. And nothing that the foreign government could do could destroy the national spirit. But though it survived, the soul of the nation drooped and weakened. Without the protection of a native government, we were exposed to the poison of foreign ways. The national character was infected and the life of the nation was endangered. We had armed risings and political agitation, but we were not strong enough to put out the foreign power until the national consciousness was fully reawakened. This was why the Gaelic movement and Sinn Féin were necessary for our last successful effort. Success came with the inspiration which the new national movement gave to our military and political effort. The Gaelic spirit working through the Doyle and the army was irresistible. In this light, we must look at the present situation. In any sane view, our military resources were terribly slender in the face of those of the British Empire, which had just emerged victorious from the World War. It was obvious what would have been involved in a renewal of armed conflict on a scale which we had never met before. It was obvious what we should have lost in strength if the support of the world which had hitherto been on our side had been alienated if Ireland had rejected terms which most nations would have regarded as terms we could honourably accept. We had not an easy task. We were faced with a critical military situation over against an enemy of infinitely greater potential strength. We had to face the pride and prejudice of a powerful nation which had claimed for centuries to hold Ireland as a province. We had to face all the traditions and political experience and strength of the British nation. And on our flank, we had a section of our own people who had identified their outlook and interests with those of Britain. It may be claimed that we did not fail in our task. We got the substance of freedom, as has already been made real before our eyes by the withdrawal of the British power. And the people approved, and they were anxious to use the freedom secured. The national instinct was sound. That the essence of our struggle was to secure freedom to order our own life without attaching undue importance to the formulas under which that freedom would be expressed. The people knew that our government could and would be moulded by the nation itself according to its needs. The nation would make the government, not the government the nation. But on the return of Ireland's representatives from London, Mr de Valera, who was then leader of the nation, condemned the treaty in a public statement, while supporting similar proposals for peace which he described as differing only by a shadow. But he, and all the deputies, 
joined in discussing and voting on the treaty, and after full discussion and expressions of opinion from all parts of the country, the treaty was approved. Michael Collins was born in 1890 and brought up in County Cork. In this article, he reflects on his education of the history of Gaelic civilization. It was not only by the British armed occupation that Ireland was subdued. It was by means of the destruction, after great effort, of our Gaelic civilization. This destruction brought upon us the loss almost of nationality itself. For the last 100 years or more, Ireland has been a nation in little more than a name. Britain wanted us for her own economic ends, as well as to satisfy her love of conquest. It was found, however, that Ireland was not an easy country to conquer, nor to use for the purposes for which conquests are made. We had a native culture, we had a social system of our own, we had an economic organisation, we had a code of laws which fitted us. These were such in their beauty, their honesty, their recognition of right and justice, and in their strength, that foreigners coming to our Ireland brought with them nothing of like attractiveness to replace them. These foreigners accepted Irish civilization, forgot their own, and eagerly became absorbed into the Irish race. The Irish social and economic system was democratic. It was simple and harmonious. The people had security in their rights and just law, and suited to them, their economic life progressed smoothly. Our people had leisure for the things in which they took delight. They had leisure for the cultivation of the mind by the study of art, literature and the traditions. They developed character and bodily strength by acquiring skill in military exercise and in the national games. The pertinacity of Irish civilization was due to the democratic basis of its economic system and the aristocracy of its culture. Each community was independent and complete within its own boundaries. The land belonged to the people. It was held for the people by the chief of the clan he was their trustee. He secured his position by the will of the people only. His successor was elected by the people. The privileges and duties of the chiefs, doctors, lawyers, bards were the same throughout the country. The schools were linked together in a national system. The bards and historians travelled from one community to another. The schools for the study of law, medicine, history, military skill belonged to the whole nation and were frequented by those who were chosen by each community to be their scholars. The love of learning and of military skill was the tradition of the whole people. They honoured not kings nor chiefs as kings and chiefs, but their heroes and their great men. Their men of high learning ranked with the kings and sat beside them in equality at the high table. It was customary for all the people to assemble together on fixed occasions to hear the law expounded and the old heroic tales recited. The people themselves contributed. They competed with each other in the games. These assemblies were the expression of our Irish civilization and one of the means by which it was preserved. Thus Ireland was a country made up of a large number of economically independent units, but in the things of the mind and spirit the nation was one. This democratic social polity, with the exaltation of the things of the mind and character, are the essence of the ancient Irish civilization, and must provide the keynote for the new. It suited our character and genius. While we were able to preserve it, no outside enemy had any power against us. While it survived, our subjection was impossible. But our invaders learned its strength and set out to destroy it. English civilization, while it may suit the English people, could only be alien to us. It is English civilization, fashioned out of their history. For us, it is a misfit. It is a garment, not something within us. We are mean, clumsy and ungraceful wearing it. 
It exposes all our defects while giving us no scope to display our good qualities. Our external and internal life has become the expression of its unfitness. The Gaelic soul of the Irish people still lives. In itself it is indestructible. But its qualities are hidden, besmirched, by that which has been imposed upon us. Just as the fine, splendid surface of Ireland is besmirched by our towns and villages, hideous medleys of contemptible dwellings and mean shops and squalid public houses, not as they should be in material fitness, the beautiful human expressions of what our God-given country is. Collins emigrated to London in 1906, and here he writes of his political education in the Gaelic League and Sinn Féin. The freedom which has been won is the fruit of the national efforts of this generation and of preceding ones. And to judge the merits of that fruit, it is necessary to recall those efforts. It is necessary to look back and to see each one arising out of each loss which the nation sustained. We see them working along their separate but converging lines, some mere trickling streams, others broad tributaries, but all which had sufficient strength and right direction reaching, becoming merged in and swelling the volume of the river which flows on to freedom. Up to the Union, English interference in Ireland had succeeded only in its military and economic oppression. The national spirit survived. The country had been disarmed after the Treaty of Limerick. The land of Ireland had been confiscated. Native industry and commerce were attacked and had been crippled or destroyed. But Gaelic nationality lived on. The people spoke their own language, preserved their Gaelic customs and ways of life and remained united in their common traditions. They had no inducement to look outside their own country and entrenched behind their language and their national traditions, they kept their social life intact. Ireland was still the Ireland of the wholly distinctive Irish people. With the Union came upheaval. The scene of government was transferred to England. The garrison, which was becoming Gaelicised towards the end of the 18th century, turned away from Ireland with the destruction of the Dublin Parliament and made London their capital. With Catholic emancipation and the so-called right to have representatives of the Irish people to sit in the foreign parliament, the national spirit was at last invaded. People began to look abroad. The Anglicisation of Ireland had begun. The English language became the language of education and fashion. It penetrated slowly at first. It was aided by the national schools. In those schools it was the only medium of education for a people who were still Gaelic-speaking. Side by side with this peaceful penetration, the Irish language decayed. And when the people had adopted a new language and had come to look to England for government, they learned to see in English customs and English culture the models upon which to fashion their own. These so-called gifts wrung for Ireland, always wrung by agitation more or less violent in Ireland itself, and never as a result of the oratory of the Irish representatives in the British Parliament. Gifts such as Catholic emancipation, land acts, local government, were not actually destructive in themselves of the Gaelic social economic system, helped in the denationalisation process. O'Connell was the product of the Ireland which arose out of this perversion. Prompted by the young Irelanders and urged on by the zeal of the people, stirred for the moment to national consciousness by the teaching of Davis, he talked of national liberty, but he did nothing to win it. He was a follower and not a leader of the people. He feared any movement of a revolutionary nature. Himself a Gaelic speaker, he adopted the English language so little did he understand the strength to the nation of its own native language. His aim was little more than to see the Irish people a free Catholic community. He would have Ireland merely a prosperous province of Britain with no national distinctiveness. Generally speaking, 
he acquiesced in a situation which was bringing upon the Irish nation spiritual decay. The young Irelanders, of whom Thomas Davis was the inspiration, were the real leaders. They saw and felt more deeply and aimed more truly. Davis spoke to the soul of the sleeping nation, drunk with the waters of forgetfulness. He sought to unite the whole people. He fought against sectarianism and all the other causes which divided them. A nationality founded in the hearts and intelligence of the people, he said, would bid defiance to the arms of the foe and the guile of the traitor. The first step to nationality is the open and deliberate recognition of it by the people themselves. Once the Irish people declare the disconnection of themselves, their feelings and interests, from the men, feelings and interests of England, they are in march for freedom. That was the true national gospel. Educate that you may be free, he said. It was only by baptism at the fount of Gaelicism that we would get the strength and ardour to fit us for freedom. But those who had succeeded to the teachings of Davis saw that if we continued to turn to England, the nation would become extinct. We were tacitly accepting England's denial of our nationhood so useful for her propaganda purposes. We were selling our birthright for a mess of pottage. The new movements were distinct, yet harmonious. They were all built on the same foundation, the necessity for national freedom. They all taught that the people must look to themselves for economic prosperity and must turn to national culture as a means to national freedom. They reached out to every phase of the people's lives, educating to make them free. No means were too slight to use for that purpose. The Gaelic Athletic Association reminded Irish boys that they were Gaels. It provided and restored national games as an alternative to the slavish adoption of English sport. The Gaelic League restored the language to its place in the reverence of the people. It revived Gaelic culture. While being non-political, it was by its very nature intensely national. Within its folds were nurtured the men and women who were to win for Ireland the power to achieve national freedom. Irish history will recognise in the birth of the Gaelic League in 1893 the most important event of the 19th century. I may go further and say not only the 19th century, but in the whole history of our nation. It checked the peaceful penetration and once and for all turned the minds of the Irish people back to their own country. It did more than any other movement to restore the national pride, honour and self-respect. Through the medium of the language it linked the people with the past and led them to look to a future which would be a noble continuation of it. The Sinn Féin movement was both economic and national, meeting therefore the two evils produced by the Union. Inspired by Arthur Griffith and William Rooney, it grew to wield enormous education and spiritual power. It organised the country. It promoted what came to be known as the Irish Ireland policy. It preached the recreation of Ireland built upon the Gael. It penetrated into Belfast and North East Ulster and was doing encouraging educational work, and was making the national revival general when the World War broke out in 1914. The Sinn Féin movement was not militant, but the militant movement existed within it and by its side. It had for its advocates the two mightiest figures that have appeared in the whole present movement, Tom Clark and Sean McDermott. The two movements worked in perfect harmony. Collins returned to Ireland in January 1916 and in Dublin he fought an Easter Rising on which he now reflects. The coming and the presence of the English had deprived us of life and liberty. Their ways were not our ways. 
their interests and their purposes meant our destruction. We must turn back again at the wheels of that infamous machine which was destroying us. We must get the English out of Ireland. Our efforts at first were naturally timid, and they were often futile, because we were too much concerned with the political side. Confused in this by the example of England, where nationality was always expressed that way, and was principally a matter of political organisation. Repeal of the Union was little more than a cry, gaining what real strength it had from the more vigorous hostility of the Young Ireland movement, which revived our old literature, which recovered Irish history and spread a new spirit. That spirit was not wholly martial, but what Irishman will say today that it was not beneficial even so. The Fenians came and once and for all raised the banner of Ireland's freedom with a definite military policy which, though unsuccessful at the time, had its full effect in bringing before men's minds the real road to Irish salvation. The Fenian idea left a torch behind it with which Tom Clark and Sean McDermott kindled the fires of Easter week and, though seemingly quenched, these were soon blazing brightly again at Solahead, at Clonfin, at Macroom, at Dublin, at many a place in Clare and Mayo and Monaghan and Donegal during the recent struggle. After the Fenians, years of death again while famine raged over the land, till Parnell emerged to struggle for independence under the name of Home Rule, which, though accompanied by the social and economic revolt of David's national land policy, was bringing us back again to the dangerous idea of seeking freedom by means of some form of political weapon. The weakness inherent in Parnell's policy was obviated by his intense personal hostility to the English. He never forgot the end in the means. But it lost that saving protection when it fell into the hands of those who succeeded him and who, in the lotus-like atmosphere of Westminster Parliament, forgot the national spirit and lost touch with the minds and feelings of their countrymen. We would have an identical situation today had we chosen the same methods and fought on the same battlefield for the last five years. In that parliamentary period, however, the people at home were growing in national consciousness and in strength and courage. The Gaelic revival and the learning of our national tongue were teaching a new national self-respect. We recalled the immortal tales of our ancient heroes and we began to look to a future in which we could have a proud, free, distinct nation worthy of the past. We learned that what we wanted was not a political form of home rule or any other kind or form of home rule, but a revival of Gaelic life and ways. Economic thought and study showed us that the poverty which afflicted us came from the presence of the English and their control over us, had come from the landlordism and the drain of English taxation, the neglect of Irish resources and the obstruction to Irish industries by the domination of the English Parliament, and we saw that we must manage these things for ourselves. And besides the hope of material emancipation, we grew to think of love of our land and all that had had given us and had still to give us, and what we could make of it when it was our own once more. And we became filled with a patriotic favour before which, when the time came, force would prove impotent. The expression of this new hope and new courage manifested itself in the Easter week rising. The leaven of the old Fenianism had been at work in our midst, Tom Clark, a member of the old Fenian Brotherhood, came out from jail after 16 years penal servitude to take up the work where he had left it off. Sean McDermott, tramping through Ireland, preaching the Fenian gospel of a freedom which must be fought for, enrolled recruits, and by his pure patriotism and lovable and selfish character, inspired all with whom he came in contact to emulate him and to be worthy of his teaching. Our army was in existence again. It was not brought into being, as is wrongfully supposed, by the example 
of Carson's recruiting in North East Ulster. It needed no such example. It was already in being the old Irish Republican brotherhood in fuller force. But England's manufactured resistance in the North East enabled our soldiers to come out into the open with the advantage in 1916 of a rising starting unexpectedly from the streets instead of from underground. England was unable or unwilling to interfere with her own orange instruments and she did not dare therefore to suppress ours. Armed resistance was the indispensable factor in our struggle for freedom. It was never possible for us to be military strong, but we could be strong enough to make England uncomfortable and strong enough to make England too uncomfortable. While she explains the futility of force by others, it is the only argument she listens to. For ourselves it had that practical advantage, but it was, above all other things, the expression of our separate nationhood. Unless we were willing to fight for our nation, even without any certainty of success, we acquiesced in the doctrine of our national identity with England. It embodied too for us the spirit of sacrifice, the maintenance of the ideal, the courage to die for it, so that military efforts were made in nearly every generation. It was a protest too, against our anglicisation and demoralisation. A challenge of spirit against material power, and as such, bore fruit. The rising of 1916 was the fruit. It appeared at the time of the surrender to have failed, and that valiant effort and the martyrdoms which followed it, finally awoke the sleeping spirit of Ireland. It carried into the hearts of the people the flame which had been burning in those who had the vision to see the pit into which we were sinking deeper and deeper and who believed that a conflagration was necessary to reveal to the countrymen the road to national death upon which we were blindly treading. The banner of Ireland's freedom had been raised and was carried forward. During the rising, the leaders of Easter week declared a republic. But not as a fact. We knew it was not a fact. It was a wonderful gesture, throwing down the gauntlet of defiance to the enemy, expressing to ourselves the complete freedom we aimed at, and for that reason was an inspiration to us. If the impossible had happened, and the rising had succeeded, and the English had surrendered, and evacuated the country, we would then have been free, and we could then have adopted the republican form of government, or any other form we wished. But the rising did not succeed as a military venture, and if it had succeeded, it would have been the surrender and the evacuation which would have been the proof of our success, not the name for, nor the form of, the government we would have chosen. If we had still a descendant of our Irish kings left, we would be as free, under a limited monarchy, with the British gone, as under a republic. The form of our government is our domestic concern. It does not affect the fact of our national freedom. Our national freedom depends upon the extent to which we reverse the history of the last 700 years, the extent to which we get rid of the enemy, and get rid of his control over our material and spiritual life. In this article, Collins comments on the period of the Great War, which resulted in the general election victory of Sinn Féin, and the establishment of Doyle Aaron in January 1919, when Collins was appointed Minister of Home Affairs. The period from 1914 to 1918 is an important one in the struggle for Irish freedom. It was a transition period. It saw a wholesome and necessary departure from the ideas and methods which had been held and adopted for a generation. And it is a period which is misread by a great many of our people, even by some who helped that departure and who helped to win the success we have achieved. 
The real importance of the Rising of 1916 did not become apparent until 1918. It is not correct to say now that the assertion of the Republican principle which was stated by the leaders of the Rising was upheld as the national policy without a break. The declaration of a republic was really in advance of national thought and it was only after a period of two years' propaganda that we were actually able to get solidarity on the idea. The European War, which began in 1914, is now generally recognised to have been a war between two rival empires, an old one and a new, the new becoming such a successful rival of the old, commercially and militarily, that the world stage was, or was thought to be, not large enough for both. Germany spoke frankly of her need for expansion and for new fields of enterprise for her surplus population. England, who likes to fight under a high-sounding title, got her opportunity in the invasion of Belgium. She was entering the war in the defence of the freedom of small nationalities. America had first looked on, but she accepted the motive in good faith, and she ultimately joined in as the champion of the weak against the strong. She concentrated attention upon the principle of self-determination and the reign of law based upon the consent of the governed. Shall, asked President Wilson, the military power of any nation or group of nations be suffered to determine the fortunes of people over whom they have no right to rule except the right of force. We were not pro-German during the war any more than we were pro-Bulgarian, pro-Turk or anti-French. We were anti-British, pursuing our age-long policy against the common enemy. Not only was this our policy, but it was the policy that any weak nation would have pursued in the same circumstances. We were a weak nation, kept in subjection by a stronger one, and we formed and adopted our policy in light of this fact. We remembered that England's difficulty was Ireland's opportunity, and we took advantage of our engagement elsewhere to make a bid for freedom. The Rising expressed our right to freedom. It expressed our determination to have the same liberty of choice in regard to our own destinies as was conceded to Poland or Czechoslovakia or any other of the nations that were emerging as a result of the new doctrines being preached. The Republic which was declared at the rising of Easter week 1916 was Ireland's expression of the freedom she aspired to. It was our way of saying that we wished to challenge Britain's right to dominate us. Ireland wished to make it clear that she stood for a form of freedom equal to that of any other nation. Other nations claim freedom, and their claims were conceded. Ireland's claim was no less strong than the claims of any nation. We had as good a right to recognition as Poland had. The position we adopted expressed a repudiation of the British government. The British form of government was monarchical. In order to express clearly our desire to depart from all British forms, we declared a republic. We repudiated the British form of government, not because it was monarchical, but because it was British. We would have repudiated the claim of a British republic to rule over us as definitely as we repudiated the claim of a British monarchy. It expressed our departure from the policy of parliamentary strategy at Westminster. That policy had failed, as it was bound to fail. It had two evils involved in it. While claiming rightly to be a distinct nation, we had been acquiescing by our actions in the convenient British doctrine that we were a British province and an integral part of the United Kingdom an acquiescence which gave Mr Lloyd George the opportunity to question our right to freedom because over a hundred years, he said, we had set representatives to Westminster and soldiers to fight in every British war. 
and it had the evil effect of causing our people to look to England for any ameliorative government and even for the so-called gift of an instalment of freedom and away from their own country from themselves, who alone could give to themselves these things. So we sank more and more into subjection during this period, and it was only by a great educational effort that our national consciousness was reawakened. We were to learn that freedom was to be secured by travelling along a different road, that instead of it being possible for the English to bestow freedom upon us as a gift, or by means of any treaty signed or unsigned, that it was their presence alone which denied it to us, and we must make that presence uncomfortable for them, and that the only question between us and them was the terms on which they would clear out and cease their interference with us. But we started along the new road, the only one that could lead to freedom, at first with faltering steps, half doubtingly looking back, the old paths which had become familiar, where we knew the milestones at which we had been able to shift the burden from one shoulder to another. The Easter week rising pointed out the road. But after that declaration of a republic, and all that it meant of repudiation of Britain, we lapsed into the old way, or took but uncertain steps upon the new one. However, abstention from attendance at the British Parliament was the indispensable factor in the Republican ideal, the repudiation of foreign government. But there was no definite united policy unto the merging of all the sectional organisations with Sinn Féin, which occurred just prior to the Great Ardèche of 1917. The Republic of Easter Week had not lived on as is supposed, supported afresh at each election, and endorsed finally in the general election of 1918. But the people grew to put their trust in the new policy, and to believe that the men who stood for it would do their best for Ireland. And at the general election of 1918, fought on the principle of self-determination, they put them in power. Here, Collins writes of the War of Independence and the last stages of British rule. Ireland's story from 1918 to 1921 may be summed up as the story of a struggle between our determination to govern ourselves and to get rid of British government and the British determination to prevent us from doing either. It was a struggle between two rival governments, the one an Irish government resting on the will of the people, and the other an alien government depending for its existence upon military force, the one gathering more and more authority, the other steadily losing ground and growing ever more desperate and unscrupulous. All the history of the three years must be read in the light of that fact. Ireland had never acquiesced in government by England. Gone forever were policies which were a tacit admission that a foreign government could bestow freedom or a measure of freedom upon a nation which had never surrendered its national claim. We could take our freedom. We would set up a government of our own and defend it. We would take the government out of the hands of the foreigner who had no right to it and who could exercise it only by force. A war was being waged by England and her allies in defence, it was said, of the freedom of small nationalities to establish in such nations the reign of law based upon the consent of the governed. We too propose to establish in Ireland the reign of law based upon the consent of the governed. At the general election of 1918, the Irish Parliamentary Party was repudiated by the Irish people by a majority of 70% and they gave authority to the representatives to establish a national government. The national government was set up in face of great difficulties. Doyle Aaron came into being British law was gradually superseded, Sinn Féin courts were set up, 
commissions were appointed to investigate and report upon the national resources of the country with a view to industrial revival. Land courts were established which settled long-standing disputes. Voluntary police were enrolled. We established a bank to finance societies which wished to acquire land. At first the British were content to ridicule the new government. Then growing alarmed at its increasing authority, attempts were made to check its activities by wholesale political arrests. The final phase of the struggle had begun. In the first two years, all violence was the work of the British armed forces, who, in their efforts at suppression, murdered 15 Irish men and wounded nearly 400 men, women and children. Meetings were broken up everywhere. National newspapers were suppressed. Over 1,000 men and women were arrested for political offences, usually of the most trivial nature. 77 of the national leaders were deported. No police were killed during these two years. The only disorder and bloodshed were the work of the British forces. These forces were kept here or sent here by the British government to harass the development of Irish self-government. They were intended to break up the national organisation. They were intended to goad the people into armed resistance then they would have the excuse which they hoped for. Then they could use wholesale violence and end up by the suppression of the national movement. But they did not succeed. The leading London newspaper, The Times, declared in a leading article of November 1st, 1920, that it was now generally admitted that a deliberate policy of violence had been conceived and sanctioned in advance by an influential section of the Cabinet. But to admit such a policy was impossible. It was necessary to conceal the real object of the reign of terror, for the destruction of the national movement which was about to begin. First, the ground had to be prepared. In August 1920, a law was passed to restore law and order in Ireland. This law in reality abolished all law in Ireland and left the lives and property of the people defenceless before the British forces. It facilitated and protected and was designed to facilitate and protect those forces in the tasks they were about to undertake. Coroners' inquests were prohibited so that no inquiry could be made into the acts of violence contemplated. National newspapers that could not be trusted to conceal the facts and to publish only supplied information were suppressed. Newspaper correspondents were threatened. The ground prepared. Special instruments had to be selected. It is, said the London Times, common knowledge that the black and tans were recruited from ex-soldiers for a rough and dangerous task. This rough and dangerous task, which had been conceived and sanctioned by the British cabinet, was to be carried out under three headings. Certain leading men and Irish army officers were to be murdered, their names being entered on a list for definite clearance All who worked for or supported the national movement were to be imprisoned and the general population was to be terrorised into submission. A special newspaper, the Weekly Summary, was circulated amongst the Crown forces to encourage them in their rough and dangerous task. As an indication of its intention, it invited them in an early number to make an appropriate hell in Ireland. Excuses for the purpose of concealment had to be invented. The public had to be prepared for the coming campaign. Mr Lloyd George in a speech in Carnarfon, October the 7th 1920, spoke of the Irish Republican Army as a, a real murder gang. We began to hear of 
steps necessary to put down a murderous conspiracy. We have got murder by the throat, said Mr Lloyd George. The murders were the legitimate acts of self-defence which had been forced upon the Irish people by English aggression. After two years of forbearance we had begun to defend ourselves and the life of our nation. We did not initiate the war, nor were we allowed to select the battleground. When the British government, as far as lay in its power, deprived the Irish people of arms and employed every means to prevent them securing arms and made it a criminal in large areas a capital defence to carry arms and, at the same time, began and carried out a brutal and murderous campaign against them and against their national government, they deprived themselves of any excuse for their violence and of any cause of complaint against the Irish people for the means they took for their protection. For all the acts of violence committed in Ireland from 1916 to 1921, England, and England alone, is responsible. She willed the conflict and fixed the form it was to take. On the Irish side it took the form of disarming the attackers. We took their arms and attacked their strongholds. We organised our army and met the armed patrols and military expeditions which were sent against us in the only possible way. We met them by an organised and bold guerrilla warfare. But this was not enough. If we were to stand up against the powerful military organisation arrayed against us, something more was necessary than a guerrilla war in which small bands of our warriors, aided by their knowledge of the country, attacked the larger forces of the enemy and reduced their numbers. England could always reinforce her army. She could replace every soldier that she lost. But there were others indispensable for her purposes, which were not so easily replaced. To paralyse the British machine, it was necessary to strike at individuals. Without her spies, England was helpless. It was only by means of their accumulated and accumulating knowledge that the British machine could operate. Without their police throughout the country, how could they find the men they wanted? Without their criminal agents in the capital, how could they carry out that removal of the leaders that they considered essential for their victory? Spies are not so ready to step into the shoes of their departed confederates as are soldiers to fill up the front line in honourable battle. And even when the new spy stepped into the shoes of the old one, he could not step into the old one's knowledge. The most potent of these spies were Irish men, enlisted in the British service and drawn from the small farmer and labourer class. Well might every Irish man at present ask himself if we were doing a wrong thing in getting rid of the system which was responsible for bringing these men into the ranks of the opponents of their own race. We struck at individuals, and by so doing we cut their lines of communication and we shook their morale. And we conducted the conflict, difficult as it was, with the unequal terms imposed by the enemy, as far as possible, according to the rules of war. Only the armed forces and the spies and criminal agents of the British government were attacked. Prisoners of war were treated honourably and considerately, and were released after they had been disarmed. On the English side they waged a sort of war, but did not respect the laws and usages of war. When our soldiers fell into their hands, they were murderers, to be dealt with by the bullet or the rope of the hangman. They were dealt with mostly by the bullet. Strangely enough, when it became law that prisoners attempting to escape should be shot, a considerably larger number of our prisoners attempted to escape than when the greatest penalty to be expected was recapture. The fact was that when the men whose names were upon the list were identified at once, they were shot at once. When they were identified during a raid, they were taken away and shot while attempting to escape or they were brought to Dublin Castle or other place of detention and questioned under torture, and on refusing to give information were murdered because they, 
revolted, seized arms, and attacked their guards. For these murders, no members of the British forces were brought to justice. The perpetrators were but enforcing the law, restoring law and order in Ireland. No matter how damaging the evidence, the prisoners were invariably acquitted, necessarily so. They were but carrying out the duties which they had been especially hired at a very high rate to execute. To excuse the terrible campaign, the world began to hear of reprisals, the natural outbreaks of the rank and file. A campaign which could no longer be concealed had to be excused. A campaign in which sons were murdered before the eyes of their mothers, in which fathers were threatened with death and done to death because they would not tell the whereabouts of their sons, in which men were made to crawl along the streets and were taken and stripped and flogged and sent back naked to their homes, in which towns and villages and homes were burned and women and children left shivering in the fields. Such reprisals could not be explained as a severe hitting back and a new excuse was forthcoming. They were suggested as a just retribution falling upon murderers. Mr Lloyd George was firmly convinced that the men who are suffering in Ireland are the men who are engaged in a murderous conspiracy. At the London Guildhall he announced that the police were getting the right men. As it became more and more difficult to conceal the truth, the plea of unpremeditation was dropped and the violence was explained as legitimate acts of self-defence. And when the terror, growing ever more violent and consequently ever more ineffective, failed to break the spirit of the Irish people, failed as it was bound to fail, concealment was no longer possible. And the true explanation was blurted out when Mr Lloyd George and Mr Bonner Law declared that their acts were necessary to destroy the authority of the Irish national government, which has all the symbols and all the realities of government. When such a moment had been reached, there was only one course left open for the British Prime Minister, to invite the Irish leaders, the murderers, and the heads of the murder gang, to discuss with him terms of peace. The invitation was to discuss terms of peace, to ascertain how the association of Ireland with the community of nations known as the British Empire may best be reconciled with Irish national aspirations. We all accepted that invitation. Collins was one of the principal delegates to the peace conference with Great Britain, which concluded with the Anglo-Irish Treaty Articles of Agreement on December 1921. Collins writes of the making of a treaty. Peace with Ireland, or a good case for further, and what would undoubtedly have been more intensive war, had become a necessity to the British cabinet. Politicians of both the great historic parties in Britain had become united in the conviction that it was essential for the British to put themselves right with the world. Referring to the peace offer which Mr Lloyd George, on behalf of his cabinet and parliament, had made to Mr de Valera in July 1921, an offer which was not acceptable to the Irish people, Mr Churchill said on September the 24th at Dundee, This offer is put forward not as the offer of a party government confronted by a formidable opposition and anxious to bargain for the Irish vote, but with the united sanction of both the historic parties in the state and indeed all parties. It is a national offer. Yes, it was a national offer, representing the necessity of the British to clean their Irish slate. The premiers of the free nations of the British Commonwealth were in England fresh from their people. They were able to express the views of their people. And the Washington Conference was looming ahead. Mr Lloyd George's cabinet had its economic difficulties at home. Their relationship with foreign countries were growing increasingly unhappy. The recovery of world opinion was becoming, in fact it had become, indispensable. 
Ireland must be disposed of by means of a generous peace. If Ireland refused that settlement, we could be shown to be irreconcilables. Then Britain would again have a free hand for whatever further actions were necessary to restore law and order in a country that would not accept the responsibility of doing so for itself. Peace had to become necessary. It was not because Britain repented in the very middle of her black and tan terror. It was not because she could not subjugate us. It was because she had not succeeded in subjugating us before world conscience was awakened and was able to make itself felt. The progress of the coercive attempts made by the government have proved in a high degree disappointing, said Lord Birkenhead, frankly, in the British House of Lords on August the 10th. What was the position on each side? Right was on our side. World sympathy was on our side. Passive sympathy, largely. We had shown a mettle that was fair indication of what we could do again if freedom were denied us. We were united. We had taken out of the hands of the enemy a good deal of government. We knew it would be no easy matter for him to recover his lost ground in that regard. We had prevented the enemy so far from defeating us. We had not, however, succeeded in getting the government entirely into our hands, and we had not succeeded in beating the British out of Ireland militarily. We had unquestionably seriously interfered with their government, and we had prevented them from conquering us. That was the sum of our achievement. We had reached in July last the high water mark of what we could do in the way of economic and military resistance. We also recognise facts in regard to North East Ulster. We clearly recognise that our national view was not shared by the majority in the four northeastern counties. We knew that that majority had refused to give allegiance to an Irish Republic. Before we entered the conference, we realised these facts among ourselves. We had abandoned for the time being the hope of achieving the ideal of independence under the Republican form. It is clear that the British on their side knew that unless we obtained a real substantial freedom, we would resist to the end at no matter what cost. But they also knew that they could make a generous settlement with us. They knew equally well that an offer of such a settlement would disarm the world criticism which could no longer be ignored. They knew that they could do these two major things and still preserve the nations of the British Commonwealth from violent disruption. The British believed, and still believe, that they need not and could not acquiesce in secession by us, and they need not and could not acquiesce in the establishment of a Republican government so close to their own shores. This would be regarded by them as a challenge, a defiance which would be a danger to the very safety of England herself. It would be presented in this light to the people of England. It would be presented as a disruption of the British Empire and would form a headline for other places. South Africa would be the first to follow our example and Britain's security and prestige would be gone. The British spokesmen believed that they dared not agree to such a forcible breaking away. It would show not only their empire to be intolerable, but themselves feeble and futile. Looking forward through the operation of the world forces to the development of freedom, it is certain that at some time acquiescence in the ultimate separation of the units will come. The American colonies of Britain got their freedom by a successful war. Canada, South Africa and the other states of the British Commonwealth are approaching the same end by peaceful growth. In this Britain acquiesces. Separation by peaceful stages of evolution does not expose her and does not endanger her. In judging the merits and examining the details of the peace we brought back, these factors must be taken into consideration. A provisional government of the Irish Free State assembled on the 14th of January 1922 and Collins was elected chairman. 
A civil war erupted when those opposed to the treaty resisted it militarily. Collins transferred from his position as chairman to that of commander-in-chief of the army. Collins justified his position in these notes. And Mr de Valera declared that there was a constitutional way of solving our differences. He expressed his readiness to accept the decision of the people. He resigned office and a provisional government was formed to act with Doyle Aaron. Two duties faced that government. To take over the executive from the English and to maintain public order during the transition from foreign to native government. And the second, to give shape in a constitution to the freedom secured. If the government had been allowed to carry out these duties, no difficulty would have arisen with England, who carried out her part by evacuating her army and her administration. No trouble would have arisen among our own people. And the general trend of development and the undoubted advantages of unity would have brought the North East quietly into the Union with the rest of the country. As soon as a stable national government had been established, into which they could have come with confidence. Mr de Valera and those who supported him in the Doyle were asked to take part in the interim government without prejudice to their principles and their right to oppose the ratification of the treaty at the elections. They were asked to help in keeping an orderly, united nation with the greatest possible strength over against England, exercising the greatest possible peaceful pressure towards the union of all Ireland and with the greatest amount of credit for us in the eyes of the world, and with the greatest advantage to the nation itself in having a strong, united government to start the departments of state and to deal with the urgent problems of housing, land, hunger and unemployment. They did not find it possible to accept this offer of patriotic service. Another offer was then made. If they would not join in the work of transition, would they not cooperate in preserving order to allow that transition peacefully to take place? Would they not cooperate in keeping the army united, free from political bias so as to preserve its strength for the proper purpose of defending the country in the exercise of its rights? This also was refused. It must be remembered that the country was emerging from a revolutionary struggle and, as was to be expected, some of our people were in a state of excitement and it was obviously the duty of all leaders to direct the thoughts of the people away from violence and into the steady channels of peace and obedience to authority. No one could have been blind to the course things were bound to take if this duty were neglected. It was neglected and events took their course. Our ideal of nationality was distorted in hair-splitting over the meaning of sovereignty and other foreign words under advice from minds dominated by English ideas of nationality. And led away, some soon got out of control and betook themselves to the very methods we had learned to detest in the English and had united to drive out of the country. By the time the Ardesh met, the drift had become apparent and the feeling in favour of keeping the national forces united was so strong that a belated agreement was arrived at. In return for a postponement of the elections, the anti-treaty party pledged themselves to allow the work of the provisional government to proceed. What came of that pledge? Attempts to stampede meetings by revolver shootings, to wreck trains, the suppression of free speech, of the liberty of the press, terrorisation and sabotage of a kind that we were familiar with a year ago. And with what object? With the sole object of preventing the people from expressing their will and of making the government of Ireland by the representatives of the people as impossible as the English government was made impossible by the United Forces a year ago. The policy of the anti-treaty party had now become clear. To prevent the people's will from being carried out because it differed from their own, to create trouble in order to break up the only possible national government and to destroy the treaty with utter recklessness as to its consequences. A section of the army, 
in an attempt at a military despotism, seized public buildings, took possession of the chief courts of law of the nation, dislocating private and national business, reinforced the Belfast boycott which had been discontinued by the People's Government, and commandeered public and private funds and the property of the people. Met by this reckless and wrecking opposition, and yet unwilling to use force against our own countrymen, we made attempt after attempt at conciliation. We appealed to the soldiers to avoid strife, to let the old feelings of brotherhood and solidarity continue. We met and made advances over and over again to the politicians, standing out alone on one fundamental point on which we owed an unquestioned duty to the people, that we must maintain for them the position of freedom they had secured. We could get no guarantee that we would be allowed to carry out that duty. The country was face to face with disaster and economic ruin and the imminent danger of the loss of the position we had won by the national effort. If order could not be maintained, if no national government was to be allowed to function, a vacuum would be created into which the English would be necessarily drawn back. To allow that to happen would have been the greatest betrayal of the Irish people, whose one wish was to take and to secure and to make use of the freedom which had been won. Seeing the trend of events, soldiers from both sides met to try and reach an understanding on the basis that the people were admittedly in favour of the treaty, that the only legitimate government could be won based on the people's will, and that the practicable course was to keep the peace and to make use of the position we had secured. These honourable efforts were defeated by the politicians. But at the eleventh hour, an agreement was reached between Mr de Valera and myself for which I have been severely criticised. It was said that I gave away too much, that I went too far to meet them, that I had exceeded my powers in making a pact which to some extent interfered with the people's right to make a free and full choice at the elections. It was a last effort on our part to avoid strife, to prevent the use of force by Irishmen against Irishmen. We refrained from opposing the anti-treaty party at the elections. We stood aside from political conflict so that, so far as we were concerned, our opponents might retain the full number of seats which they had held in the previous doyle. And I undertook, with the approval of the government, that they should hold four out of the nine offices in the new ministry. They calculated that in this way they would have the same position in the new doyle as in the old. The old. But their calculations were upset by the people themselves and they then dropped all pretense of representing the people and turned definitely against them. The irregular forces in the four courts continued in their mutinous attitude. They openly defied the newly expressed will of the people on the pretext of enforcing a boycott of Belfast goods, they raided and looted a Dublin garage, and when the leader of the raid was arrested by the national forces, they retaliated by the seizure of one of the principal officers of the National Army. Such a challenge left two courses open to the national government, either to betray its trust and surrender to the mutineers, or to fulfil its duty and carry out the work entrusted to it by the people. The government did its duty. Having given them one last opportunity to accept the situation, to obey the people's will, when the offer was rejected, the government took the necessary measures to protect the rights and property of the people and to disperse the armed bands which had outlawed themselves and were preying upon the nation. Unbelievers had said that there was not and had never been an Irish nation capable of harmonious, orderly development. That it was not the foreign invader, but the character of the Irish themselves, which throughout history had made of our country a scene of strife. We knew this to be a libel. Our historians had shown our nationality as existing from legendary ages and through centuries of foreign oppression. 
What made Ireland a nation was a common way of life, which no military force, no political change could destroy. Our strength lay in a common ideal of how a people should live bound together by mutual ties and by a devotion to Ireland which shrank from no individual sacrifice. This consciousness of unity carried us to the success in our last great struggle. In that spirit we fought and won. The old fighting spirit was as strong as ever, but it had gained a fresh strength in discipline in our generation. Every county sent its boys, whose unrecorded deeds were done in the spirit of Hugh Holland at the ford. But the fight was not for one section of the nation against another, but for Ireland against the foreign oppressor. We fought for that for which alone fighting is really justified, for national freedom, for the right of the whole people to live as a nation. And we fought in a way we had never fought before, and Ireland won a victory she had never won before. The foreign power was withdrawn. On a military tour of his own native county, Cork, Michael Collins was killed in an ambush on the 22nd of August, 1922, at a spot known in Irish as Bill Namla, in English, the Mouth of the Blossom. <laughs>